We all know that it is important to make a good impression and the clothes you choose say a lot about what sort of person you are. I am Sandra Twinobdio and today on Eco Africa we're going to be looking at a topic that is very close to my heart, fashion. And to mine too, Sandra, as you can see. So we've been looking into what happens to all the used clothes, especially the thousands of tons of cheap fashion that are thrown away each week. I am Chris Lems, and this is what else we've got for you today on the show. The rediscovery of the miracle plant hemp as a versatile raw material. A surprising solution to the waste from Tunisia's olive oil harvest. And the high-tech ways in which South Africa is protecting hundreds of shark species. Recycling clothes is big business, as more people get used to changing their look often. One problem with this cheap fast fashion is that it is often so poorly made that it cannot be reused. For textile traders in Ghana, the millions of old clothes imported from mainly Western countries are often more rags than riches. Almost half gets thrown away, which is clogging up land feeds, beaches, and the ocean. We met some people who are finding ways to stop that happening. These fashions from the Ghanaian capital are young, urban, and above all, mega hip. You can look good and take responsibility. That's the message from Accra's young designers, like Elisha Barfel, and the duo behind the non-profit label The Revival, Yahira Akbofa and Kwamena Dazi Boysen. Our, our design is just our tool, our tool to um, engage every individual, you know, every global citizen to, to wake up and say and question everything about the clothes that we wear or things that we are consuming. At this studio in Accra, the two men mix different materials and pre-loved garments to create something new. Used clothes that arrive in Ghana by the ton from the US, Europe and Asia are a source of inspiration. As we all know, our materials used in clothing are non-biodegradable, most of them, and then they have a very um, negative impact on the environment when it's being disposed. So we are trying to deconstruct the idea of what waste really means when it comes to textile, when it comes to fashion. And this is where the men from the Revival source their materials, Kantamanto, the biggest market for second-hand clothing in Ghana and across West Africa. Here, some 30,000 traders buy, sort and resell around 40,000 tons of clothing each year. More than 15 million items change hands each week, though due to their poor quality, roughly half of them end up in the trash. That's it. We get the London ones, the China ones, the Korea ones, the Canada ones, and the, we get the Greece, we get A, we get B. And it's not all that good. Yeah, so you open it and out of the day you get racks. That's given rise to a flourishing upcycling business in Cantamanto, where many textile merchants still try to find takers for their lower quality wares. Some local initiatives add a dash of colour to faded fabrics to tempt potential buyers. In Taylor's workshops, old clothes are used to make new ones. As cheap clothing becomes more available around the globe, the mountains of second-hand textiles keep growing in Ghana. What starts as fast fashion soon winds up here, often strewn on the beaches and in the sea. And because more synthetic fibers are being used in garments, the materials with their chemical residues may linger here for centuries. It's a threat that worries fashion activist and environmental researcher Harriet Ann Ajabing. 
I am concerned about the environment. I'm concerned about everybody within the secondhand business supply chain because fast fashion and secondhand go hand in hand. So, yeah, I guess. And our air is polluted, apparently. So these are just um, things that we should start paying a lot more attention to and start consciously developing business modules that actually puts pressure, less pressure on the environment. But she says we really need to get to the root of the problem. Ghana's quality controls for second-hand clothing imports are in urgent need of improvement. Not everyone sees Cantamanto as um, a, a hub for the sourcing of raw materials. So I feel holding the brands, the fast fashion brands, accountable and looking at it, uh, looking at the bigger picture of how, I mean, the regulations could actually contribute to national socioeconomic development. To date in Ghana, it's been mainly activists or artists like Michael Gah, who've given much thought to how to use the clothing waste that's already in the country. I saw this um, pieces around that um, people are not buying. So I took it upon myself to also buy them to create my pieces, um, not only for, for the beauty, I'm also um, creating awareness for the environment because these are some of the, um, like the materials that you find in the, in the beaches as waste and, and they choke our gutters too. So I'm also um, creating awareness for um, people to be eco-friendly. Cheap clothes can even be transformed into art. It's one of the creative ways of dealing with the waste from fast fashion imports. At least biodegradable fabrics such as cotton and wool will eventually decompose. But these days, the most used fabric is polyester, which hangs around as waste and is hard to recycle. You can burn it, which is not good. Our scientists in England are hoping you can find natural chemical compounds that can eat up the plastic clothing and turn it into something reusable again. In this laboratory in the British coastal city of Portsmouth, researchers are deep freezing articles of clothing. The experiments with liquid nitrogen and polyester shirts are being conducted to deal with an ever worsening problem. Obviously with growing population, there's a growing demand for textiles uh, and we uh, have a, a burgeoning um, waste problem with those textiles when they reach their end of life. So we, dr we very rapidly need uh, solutions to, to deal with uh, the recycling issue. Worldwide, consumers are turning to fast fashion, clothes manufactured at low cost and with high turnover. A cherished material, polyester, this clothing fiber accounts for 60% of what we wear. It's a fast drying, durable, and above all, cheap fabric, making it very popular in the fast moving clothing industry. But fast fashion clothes are discarded by the ton in landfills like this one in Kenya. And polyester, a synthetic fiber, is practically impossible to recycle. But the scientists in Portsmouth are harnessing the power of enzymes. So we have uh, engineered enzymes uh, to be capable of tackling the polyester in uh, single-use plastic bottles such as this one here. And what we want to do is to see whether the enzymes that can break down these plastic bottles are also able to break down the polyester in fabrics such as this. Once frozen in liquid nitrogen, the material is ground into tiny bits. Next, those particles are placed in a bioreactor, where they're mixed with the enzymes. So we can think of an enzyme as like, almost like a pair of scissors. So when we take our plastics, they're just like a very long string of different molecules. And then we use our enzymes to cut that string in specific places. Um, so when we do that, at the end of the reaction, we have like this soup of different parts of the plastic, which we can then sort of separate off into different things. And then we can react those to either make a new plastic or they can be used in other chemical industries. 
The researchers in Portsmouth have already identified more than 70 enzymes that can break down polyester, a development that will hopefully lead to more sustainability in the clothing industry. Let's move now to aromateria that is used in many different ways and goes by many names. Hemp and cannabis are the best known. We are talking about a plant which has been used in its innocent form for hundreds of years for textiles, pepper, medicine, energy and oil. But the rise of the drug trade caused hemp to be demonized and criminalized. But do stay tuned, this miracle plant is making a comeback and that has also its benefits for the environment. It goes by many names. Hemp, cannabis, marijuana, we, ganja. And just as diverse as its names are its uses. We made our textiles, paper, medicine, energy, oil, all with hemp until we started demonizing and criminalizing it. We've hammered it down into uh, humanity's head that this is an illegal and massively bad plant. Hemp cultivation started 12,000 years ago in China. And from there, humans spread it everywhere. Sailors used highly durable hemp for their ropes and sails. So they took the seeds with them everywhere. Because after wood, Hemp was the second most used material on the ships. Its flowers have been used as medicine for thousands of years, as well as in spiritual practices, or just simply for pleasure. But then came the dark ages for cannabis. New technologies were invented for cotton, which boosted its supply as a fiber. Trees replaced hemp as a paper source. And later, sails and rope were made with petroleum-based synthetics. Now, the miracle plant is making a comeback. Scientists are slowly discovering that its uses can go well beyond what we have known so far and could help us clean up a lot of industries. A big one is construction. The building and housing industry produces almost 40% of all carbon dioxide emissions. But hemp might help change that. Hemp wool is already in use as an insulation material. But now, more and more sustainable construction companies use hempcrete to build walls and floors too, like this 12-floor building made with hempcrete in South Africa. Hempcrete is basically a mixture of hemp shives and lime. Lime petrifies the hemp so it doesn't degrade or break. It is light but strong. It is breathable so it regulates moisture and temperature better. That means lower energy builds, no mold, and basically a non-toxic environment. It is fire resistant, and due to its flexibility, it can withstand major earthquakes. Its insulation properties are also off the charts. It works as heat, sound, and humidity insulation. And after its lifetime, hempcrete can be reused as fertilizer, as it is totally organic. But hempcrete walls do not only produce less carbon than concrete ones, they are actually carbon negative. That means hempcrete stores more CO2 than it requires to make and transport. That is due to hemp's carbon storage capacity. Hemp fiber insulation stores on a net base more than 50 kilograms of carbon dioxide per cubic meter of hemp insulation. For your reference, the production of glass wool or rock wool insulation emits over 250 kilograms of carbon dioxide. But the obstacle is, in most countries, construction regulations are very strict and introducing a new construction material can take years of testing and bureaucracy. Hemp is at the beginning of that road in many countries. We need to give it a new chance and, and stop putting all these regulations on hemp. We need to free this up entirely for the industries to really move forward. Hemp can also help to reduce deforestation. Until the late 19th century, most paper was made of hemp. Early Bibles and even the drafts of the US Declaration of Independence were written on hemp. But today, paper is made from trees, and it is one of the biggest drivers of deforestation. Every year we lose forests the size of Portugal. 15% of all trees we chop down are used to make paper. 
global demand is expected to at least double, and in some cases almost triple. While we are losing our forests, some companies are more willing to reintroduce hemp into their paper production. Textile industry is a little bit the holy grail, the Champions League uh, for, the, for the, any fiber. It's also a champion polluter, because cotton needs a lot of toxic pesticides and water. A hectare of hemp can produce two and a half times more fiber than a hectare of cotton. It can grow up to five meters within just three to five months. Hemp fiber is not only better for the environment, but its strong fibers also make longer lasting textiles. Less water, less fertilizer, less land and no pesticides, but stronger and lasting fibers. But there's a catch. If you want to be uh, successful uh, implementing uh, hemp fiber into the textile industry, we have to modify the hemp fiber to the existing textile machinery, because other way around is not going to happen because the investments to do so are just too high. Thanks to the pressures the textile industry has been facing, companies and researchers have been trying to find alternatives. Now, using enzymes or mechanical processes, they have found environmental ways to cottonize and integrate hemp fibers into their existing production. But this is still in the early stages, and it will take some time until the industry agrees on the best way to cottonize the hemp. This is the first problem hemp is facing in other industries too lack of standard methods because of missing research and development for decades. Regulations are still confusing and they change from country to country. These differences, plus the fact that marijuana is still a controlled substance, scare off the investors. But against all odds, global industrial hemp demand was calculated to have a $4 billion market value in 2021 and is expected to reach almost $17 billion by 2030. That's something to look out for indeed. Now to another interesting plant, the olive tree. It flourishes in Tunisia and has made the North African country the largest producer of olive oil outside the European Union. But the bountiful harvest produces a lot of organic waste that has not proven very useful until now. Find out in this week's Doing a Bit. The olive harvest takes place during the cold season. Winters in northern Tunisia can be brutal. Temperatures can drop down to freezing. The country needs fuel for heating. But even if there are hardly any forests, there are countless olive groves. Tunisia is one of the biggest olive oil producers in the world. The extraction process creates a lot of leftover pumice or olive pulp. That gave Yassine Khalifi an idea. Why not use the pumice for heating? I had an idea in my head that I have kept since my childhood because I visited the oil mills with my father during the extraction of the olive oil. I saw there that the pomance was used for heating, for cooking and so on and then it clicked. Briquettes made from olive pomace. Yassine is a geo engineer who founded the startup BioHeat in 2020. It now produces 150 tons of briquettes every year. The good news is that they eliminate the need for logging because the heating value is three times higher than conventional wood briquettes and has lower carbon dioxide emissions. Pizzerias are using them in their ovens because of the good burning properties. And Hefti Ben Amo, who runs a hammam, has nothing but good things to say. They are magnificent. They smell lovely and also provide very good heat. The success story is affecting locations well beyond Tunisia. In the south of France, a steam train is being powered by a Sin Khalifi's olive briquettes. And how about you? If you're also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We share your stories. 
South Africa's coastline stretches far more than 3,000 kilometers and the waters around it are home to an abundance of marine life including hundreds of shark species. Now these predators are often vilified and feared but their role in the ocean ecosystem is now recognized as extremely important. South Africa has been a trailblazer in shark conservation. So let's take a deeper dive into the innovative tools used to study and also protect these often endangered species. Migrating blue sharks are frequent visitors to the coast of South Africa. Puff adder shy sharks and gully sharks are native to its kelp forest. These brown seaweeds are home to more than 200 shark species. Shark expert Ryan Daly regularly monitors their activities. To conserve sharks, we need to know where they go, where they spend time. So we are tagging these sharks to figure out where they go and identify critical habitat for them so that we can improve protection for these critical areas. He and his team fit the sharks with acoustic transmitters so they can track them, a procedure the sharks barely notice. Okay, scalpel. Once they've been tagged, the transmitter emits an ultrasonic pulse for six years. In the last couple of years, we've tagged over 100 sharks, representing about 10 or 12 different species. Many of these sharks are endangered, and we hope to find out more about where they go. Specifically, over multiple years, we hope to identify critical areas for them. Over 150 receivers are moored along the seabed to detect the signals from the tagged sharks. Whenever one of them swims by, the receiver records its ID number. The signal ranges up to one kilometer. The acoustic receivers are regularly brought onto dry land, so the data they've logged can be evaluated. We have to work with a big network of collaborators to share data on their receivers. So all of the data we collect on these receivers gets shared within a network and then we're able to figure out where these sharks have been, where they're spending their time, so that we can prioritize their conservation. The program can only work so long as there's broad support for shark conservation efforts. From an early age, humans are afraid of these ocean predators. Shark populations can only survive if public attitudes to them change, and that requires raising awareness. By changing the mindsets, I believe that uh, I am changing the world one step at a time or one kid at a time. For me, if I have a group of 40 learners and I'm changing the mindset of one child, even if it's going to their families and teaching them why sharks are important, we are already um, making such a big difference. The media tends to report on sharks mainly when there have been attacks on humans. At the Shark Education Center in Cape Town, children can learn about the valuable role they play in marine ecosystems and get up close with shark eggs and even teeth. This actually changed my perspective on how they actually live and that they're not actually a danger to us, that we actually endanger them by polluting and by catching. Conservationists have also equipped an underwater camera with bait so they can also observe smaller, shyer sharks that lurk in the kelp forest off the coastline. It lures them out of hiding, allowing the researchers to gain useful insights into ocean biodiversity. The collected data is analyzed using a program the team developed to help them assess their findings. We've taken some open source machine learning software and trained it on hundreds of images of sharks and fish and all of the species that we come across here in False Bay um, so that we can use it for detecting these species in videos in the future. Their research has already proved highly constructive 
There is already more public acceptance of shark conservation, and conservation areas now make up 5% of South Africa's oceans. Environmentalists would like to see that area increase further in order to protect marine ecosystems. Well, it's time to return to dry land. I hope you liked the show and had some key takeaways. My name is Sandra Twinovdio saying goodbye from Kampala here in Uganda. And a bye-bye also from me, Chris Alems in Ogun State, Nigeria. Would love to hear from you on our social media platform. If you have any concept or ideas to share, take care and see you next week. Yeah.